Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you for the very kind greetings and warm welcome from all of you. As you've heard, I hail from the United States, so it's been a couple of days to get here. And I thank my husband, Michael, for coming with me. It's been an adventure. And we're going to stay in the country of India for about a week or so after this to enjoy your fine country. So we're looking forward to that also. So what I wanted to share with you this morning is some personal perspectives, some that I shared when I was inaugurated as the president of IFHIMA in Dubai a little over two months ago. And I want to talk about, which kind of follows the theme for your conference, the intersection of health information and health information management, which is something I have believed in for a long time. So I commend all of you organizers and the organizing committee for truly bringing the two together in this conference and in the content through the next two days. So you've heard that I'm from San Francisco, and that is partially true. I lived in California for about 35 years before I moved to Northwest Montana a couple of years ago. You see by this picture, Michael and I live in snow country. Today in Big Fork, Montana, where we're from now, when we moved there about two years ago, it's about a minus five Celsius, so a tad bit difference in climate than what you have here. I've had a diverse career that's covered a lot of ranges of health information and health information uh, informatics. Directors at large and small hospitals, I've functioned as a consultant off and on for years. I have functioned in what some might consider the dreaded professions of sales and marketing, and I've had a lot of volunteer opportunities through my years with IFHEMA, and now as the president of IFHEMA for three years, as well as decades when I volunteered for the American Health Information Management Association, the California Association, and other state associations. So my message to the students in the audience, and I was delighted this morning when I stopped and had a little breakfast to see how many students there are at this conference. My message to the students is, by all means, volunteer. Start your volunteer service early in your career because the payback, both personally and professionally, is something that you simply cannot monetize. I truly have friends around the globe in all the continents, obviously with the exception of Antarctica, where I have been able to talk about the challenges of our profession, the new horizons for our profession, and then what goes on with each of our personal lives. In my career, I've always had data, ironically, at the center of it. It's not because it was planned that way, although perhaps a little bit of planning at the midpoint in my career, but it is something that just happened in my career. And I think everybody who's sitting here in the audience would say, well, I didn't start my profession thinking that I was going to have exposition in health information management or health informatics. I took a journey, as you've heard talked about this morning, because it is a journey each of us have in our profession. For those of you who may not be familiar with IFHEMA, the International Federation of Health Information Management Associations, we are an umbrella organization in official relations as a non-governmental entity with the World Health Organization. So I was particularly delighted to hear that Dr. Madhu is from the WHO Collaborating Center here in India, and we're going to have a few conversations about that after we finish the program today. You'll see we have member nations, as the map represents here, 
Some years we have 24 member nations, some years 21 or 22. The number changes a little bit from year to year. We are definitely in a growth pattern, particularly in the continent of Africa, where the health information management profession is gaining greater recognition, and you now see that we have five members from that region. As I was doing my research for this presentation and the fact that while some might say health information management and health informatics are two very different professions, and I do have some friends who actually think that way, I was struck in some of the references that you see here, and apologies if, if the fine print of my references are tough to read, I can certainly give you my slides, but the familiarity and the commonality, which naturally leads to the collaboration that happens between our two professions. So it's about the data, it's about the detail, and it's about having information that is valued and trusted, and we already heard the words about value and trust this morning, having the data that can truly be valued and trusted to make the decisions that are gonna make health and wellness a commonality as opposed to the way medicine might traditionally have been about curing. So it's health and wellness that are leading this conversation in the future. Obviously, with a great deal of technology to make things happen today that weren't feasible five or 10 or 20 years ago. Here's a few quotes just to reflect upon what various countries, various industry luminaries say about the cost of healthcare, and it really doesn't matter what nation you're from. Everybody says healthcare costs too much, and I don't get as much value from the dollars I might spend or my government might spend as what I should. You'll notice here the quote about innovation, that it is essential in order to change the conversation about health care and to take better care of people and families. Access to health care is an issue everywhere in the world also. While I may come from the U.S., which has the highest cost of health care in the world, that doesn't mean we have the best health care in the world. And one of the reasons we don't is because of the issue of access. Unless you're employed in a good job that has a good health insurance, or you're 65 or over, or you're a veteran, or you, uh, you may have challenges with access to health care even in the United States. And then some quotes about data. And you could do research just like I did to come up with these recent quotes. And it, what it really does is affirms the importance of our profession, the importance of data, and the importance of technology in making healthcare more accessible, more affordable, and applying innovation to make that happen. During the first few decades of my career, and I've been working over 40 years in the health information profession, sadly what we had was that data sat in various silos, in various platforms, in various organizations, and was never looked at holistically in order to improve the health and well-being of me as a patient or as a person or as a citizen. But that has changed in almost every country around the world now. Data is being used absolutely to design new systems, to make access more affordable, to diagnose and treat conditions way before you used to. I noticed yesterday, in fact, when I was reading um, some headlines about the coronavirus in China, it said artificial intelligence had actually been able to detect the trends of the coronavirus in China a week before the CDC in the US did. And I thought, well, there's no more proof than that, certainly, of the value of technology 
and what it could do if we will listen to what the technology tells us. So it is a skill shift as we think about how to use technology, how to appropriately apply technology, and that skill shift means people like you and I who work in our professions, we need to be better at managing, curating data. And I have a friend who specifically uses the word curating data because he says you can't take data at face value. You've got to be able to nurture and curate and improve that data and perhaps standardize that data in order to make it meaningful to the future of the healthcare industry. And I think these demands are a perfect fit for our professions to build that trusted data, to create the value, and to ensure that we are using data to help shape the industry changes so that we're a part of those changes. But yet it's not that you throw the data over the baton and think, oh, it's going to be good enough, or I'm sure security is going to be managed, or I think privacy will be considered in how you use data, or I'm going to anonymize this data, or I'm going to use the personally identifiable form of the data. So my point in this particular slide is to share with you that we do have to have governance around all of the data that has le left the silos or is leaving those silos systems applications where the data might have sat a decade or two decades ago. But we don't want to over govern data in order that it not be useful and people are fearful of using it. So there is a fine balance and why many organizations are building a data governance program or an information governance program in order to ensure that the data is fit for purpose and that it should be used in the way that people are thinking about it. And I'll put a plug in here for the information governance white paper that Ifhema wrote uh, about two and a half years ago now. Linda Kloss, who is the former CEO of Ahima, and myself, along with colleagues from Canada, the US, Australia, and the UK, wrote the paper to giving you insight and case studies about the importance of governing data. It's out there on IFHEMA's website if you're interested in it. So the challenges, and we know there are many challenges in using data and in trying to improve health and healthcare and move to a wellness-oriented approach to healthcare. One of the challenges is the aging of the global population and the cost that chronic diseases have. You can go to any of the World Health Publications and, and the OECD ones and others that talk about the fact that over 10% of the world's population is 65 or more. I happen to be in that part of the population. And that population has much higher costs, particularly as the age goes to 80 and 90, a much higher cost to care for them because of the cost of chronic diseases. You'll read also that 10 to 25% of the world's population has type 2 diabetes. We all know that's a very expensive disease um, that is somewhat based upon lifestyle, somewhat based upon genetics. So we need to think how we're going to use data to help manage those chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes, congestive heart failure, arthritis, etc. Another challenge that I thought worth mentioning, particularly in the context of our profession, is are we the leaders or are we the followers when it comes to using technology and using the data that we've created? I hope you'd all raise your hands if I took an opinion poll and say, we're the leaders. But the reality is, many times we're the followers because we think we have to have perfection, perhaps, before we use the data, as opposed to what's a reasonable standard that might be applied to the data. So let's always think about, do we want to be the leader 
or do we want to be the follower as we try to bend that cost curve or to improve the quality and the accessibility of health care? When it comes to the health information management profession, you'll frequently hear people around the globe talk about workforce development because we need to upskill the health information management profession so that they fully embrace technology, fully embrace the importance of data and data quality, lest we be a profession that has survival challenges. And certainly in Europe and in the US, the HIM profession is not a growth profession right now. While there are changes being made in curricula and in professional associations, and the same thing is happening in Australia, um, we need to really rethink how we're gonna develop the workforce around health information management in order to be the workforce of the future that we need. And perhaps one of the ways we do that is thinking forward just a few years when ICD-11 will come to various countries around the world. I'm sure you all know that it was released about a year ago by the World Health Organization. The beta projects have been done. The software has been coded. I, in Banff, Canada, last October, I saw the preview of the learning modules that are being developed by the National Center for Coding and, and Healthcare in Sydney, Australia, and it was a fabulous demo of how they could do very intuitive searches for the coded conditions in ICD-11. So I think ICD-11 has the potential to be that breath of fresh air to the profession, to really embrace what it can do for all of us and what it can do for coding and coded data around the world. I'm gonna have a conversation. I'm just gonna give Dr. Madhu a thumbs up or a heads up here. When does she think ICD-11 will come to India? Most countries say it's probably someplace between 2025 and 2030. Since I come from the United States, as I said, well, if it comes in my lifetime in the US, I'll be happy, considering we are amongst the last ones to adopt ICD-10. But I hope we've learned from some of our lessons. But there are the movers and the shakers, like Japan, for example, who will be amongst the first. They've done the translations. So hopefully in the next decade, we'll all see ICD-11 adopted in our countries and see the benefits that can bring with all the technology that's being embedded in it. And if you've read any articles, you know that WHO says every day when they talk about ICD-11, there will be no books. I'm not totally sure I believe that, We'll see what the vendor community does out there, but it is certainly designed to only be a computer program that can be embedded with whatever EHR system you have, and it would certainly be a move to the future to get higher quality standardized data. So we'll see where that goes. So ICD-11, I think, goes hand in hand with the industry recognition for the health information and the health informatics profession. I'm very big on what it can do for all of us for a variety of reasons. A couple of years ago, I read um, a long article about a publication by Klaus Schwab, and he gave a uh, speech at the World Economic Forum. It was either two years ago or three years ago, and he wrote this book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution, where he talks about what technology and what data is going to do to revolutionize the world. And his book, I believe, is about three years old now. So he was really ahead of the days of talking about artificial intelligence, perhaps, and machine learning, which are mainstream conversations today and talking about what the data explosion world, what the digital explosion world can do to impact literally every segment of an economy, every segment of data that is captured about citizens or pro products or, and health and well-being. 
And he said the difference when you think about data being a part of the fourth industrial revolution is it's fundamentally gonna change the way we think, we live, and we work. And we certainly see that because as we started the conference today, we were all reminded to turn our cell phones off so that they weren't ringing. And at every conference we go to now, that is one of the opening message because we live and breathe by our cell phones and all the data and the information that rings to us. But Klaus had a little pause as a part of his conversation. And he said, there are serious risks with the data and the information that we're gathering and that we are using because we need governments involved to make sure that the benefits are considered as well as the risk and what the power of data can be for good or for bad to ensure that we don't create inequality more than what we have today. So he, among other things, talked about we live and work and obviously travel in a global interconnected society and certainly all the countries that are represented here today prove that this is a global interconnected society. I think perhaps the most profound thing he said in all that I read was he talked about the fact that when you think about all the data that's being created and used you need to think how you're going to manage and curate and use that data. And you need to do so in a multi-stakeholder approach because that multi-stakeholder approach is essential to that fourth revolution, the wise use of data. It's not just Lorraine's viewpoint or Sabu's viewpoint or Mujib's viewpoint. Data is used for so many different purposes today. You've got to have that multi-stakeholder collaborative, just like you have a bouquet of flowers. It's a bouquet of ideas and thoughts and perceptions and perspectives that get brought so that we use the data wisely in trying to make better use of that data for economic, social, and the human context in which we live. And the last point out of this book, and then we'll move on, is his biggest concern was that as we think about how to appropriately use data to make better our lives and our health and our citizen services and our products and everything else, he said decision makers are too often caught into the past linear thinking, kind of like that data that sits in silos in the decades ago. And we need to think much more aggressively in a disruptive, innovative fashion about what can we disrupt in business processes, in data uses, in shaping and innovating for the future, for a better world for all of us. When I gave my address in Dubai as the incoming president about two and a half months ago, and I saw a few of you there, I shared what my vision was for IFEMA for the three years that, that I will be president. And for those of you who don't know IFEMA well, I will tell you uh, we have a very thin bank account. Uh, we have a volunteer board that represents the six World Health regions plus the president, president-elect, and past president, and we have zero paid staff. So that tells you um, how we try to strategically think about what do we do, how do we make wise use of our resources, and yet change the conversation and move the health information management profession forward. So this was what I said my vision is, that we must prepare for the impact of technology and not be reactive. As I said before, unfortunately, the profession in many uh, segments was seen as reactive. We need to be proactive and involved in the technology and in the data 
and in preparing for ICD-11 as a specific example. I'm a firm believer in publish or perish, and I'm not an academic where that mantra might come from. I believe you have to publish, and we as IFHEMA as an organization need to publish, whether it's on our website, whether it's through social media, whether it's publishing white papers, whether it's me in enjoying my time here in India and thanking Sabu for the invitation. We must be very clear about what our vision is, what our goals are, and how we're going to serve our membership. And one thing I'll point out is that during Marcy McDonald's term of president, which was the prior three years, we went through as an organization and updated 11 learning modules that are on the IFHEMA website. This is not formal curriculum. It doesn't have the rigor and the structure that formal curriculum would, but these learning modules are very helpful, perhaps to small rural hospitals, perhaps to organize and orient volunteers, or perhaps for recruitment that you might use to gain students in your different programs. So take a look at our website and look for those learning modules. Today, we have two um, calls out uh, for work groups. One is for social media, because I will confess, we have done a pathetic job of social media in promoting IFEMA, and that must change, in my opinion, and the board agrees. So we have another week to accept volunteers for our social media work group. If any of you like working with social media, go to the IFEMA website and fill out the volunteer form to apply for that particular work group. We also have a work group open for workforce development that is going to be led by Dr. Karen Butler Henderson from Tasmania and Dr. Susan Fenton from uh, the University of Texas in Houston. If you're someone who's a good writer and a good researcher and interested in doing some heavy lifting about workforce development, go to our website and apply for that work group. And that really falls into organizing volunteers. I believe IFEMA can be a stronger membership if we use our volunteers more effectively. So I have pushed that very hard um, during my first three months and will continue to do so. One of the other things, and I'll close this section out, is our strategic plan. I think it's time because the world of healthcare has changed a great deal in the last 10 years, to take a step back and look at what our strategic direction should be. And to that end, the board will meet in Chicago in early April, and we will digest all of the member fee feedback we've gotten from surveys, the Congress in Dubai, and a special survey we're gonna be doing in the next couple of weeks here to really guide us in order to govern the association better and make wise use of our membership talent and the dollars that we have to advance the profession. This whole process, as the quote goes there, is really about simplicity. We're not trying to be complex. We're trying to be simple and focused and very clear in our thought processes so that the end of my three-year term and the next three-year term that Karen Butler Henderson will lead, that we can truly say these were our goals, this is what we accomplished, we set these metrics, we met these goals in order to advance the profession and in health information. I spoke just a minute about the white paper, the information governance white paper that we published about two and a half years ago. In November at the IFHEMA 50th Anniversary Congress in Dubai, we released our privacy white paper. You see the two links on these slides. These are readily available on the IFHEMA website. So the one we released in November, I will say, took some very serious heavy lifting because we discussed privacy. And once you open the book on privacy, it's kind of hard to decide where do you stop 
the conversation, and that was one of the challenges we had. The body of the white paper talks about the challenges, the history, where the industry is going in privacy, because privacy is obviously far more than just health care, and there is so much integrated health and social service and wellness data, you certainly can't put a box around privacy and health care. So go to the website. You can register for these white papers and pull them down. We certainly hope you will. There are case studies attached to the privacy white paper. And this afternoon, um, I will join Dr. Sabu and Mujib and Selva, and I'm not sure who else. And we're going to talk about the Indian case study uh, in a privacy session this afternoon as well as some of the other content in the privacy white paper. So I hope you will join us in this very important health information and health informatics topic. So I want to close my address going back to a few words that we've heard throughout the morning. We've talked about data, we've talked about information, we've talked about value, and we've talked about trust. And this is just a little saying that I use to remind me when I think of how do I spend my time and my money and how do I set my priorities. I want to be the person that no matter where I go, and I hope you will agree with this, or who you're with, we add value to the lives around you. I think we add value through our health information and health informatics profession. I think we can have a profound impact on the appropriate use of technology and the wise use of technology to truly disrupt healthcare around the globe and make it about health and well-being and wellness for you and I as citizens and you and I as consumers and as patients. And thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs>